Hi everybody, we're back here, it's my workshop, my name's Paul Way. Um, really, really hot uh, Thursday afternoon, so we've got the fan going. Um, Charlie's on the camera there, and uh, so today we're going to do, uh, or, or take the, the project further on from what we were doing on Tuesday. If you were watching on Tuesday, we were using airbrushes, and so we were doing all sorts of things. Basically an introduction to airbrushes, what you can expect to, to get when you buy an airbrush, the difference between um, suction feed, um, and gravity fed, all that sort of stuff. If you decide to then go on and, and use airbrushes and things like that in your projects, your wood turning or woodworking projects. Um, we ended up making a little picture using some homemade stencils. Um, again, how's that Charlie? Is that all right up a little bit? There we are. So what I thought would be fun is let's make, let's make a little platter, a little plate, and we'll use the scene that we made. We'll recreate that on the platter. Um, so there's a little bit of turning involved as well because I did note there's a few people saying well this isn't turning and all that sort of stuff I get that, I get that, it's not everybody's cup of tea but some of you might want to use airbrushes um, and colouring on timber alright, I did say it was fairly controversial when we looked at it um, on Tuesday so, so we're going to for the next hour I'll be playing around with this lovely bit of this is a bit of sycamore lovely um, friend of mine, Nick Agar, you probably know if you're into wood turning, when he was moving um, he needed to get rid of some of his timber, so this is a bit of his timber, um, and we're going to just, it's a very thin piece, it's probably about 25 mil. it's also warped as well, but there's a bit, a bit of ripple in there, so it's going to be a plate, a little, a little thin plate, um, I've only got sort of fairly shallow screws in there, so I'm going to start with the tailstock in place, Just give myself just a little bit of extra security. There we go. And we're going to then make, so this is going to be the back. We're then, um, I'm going to take some of the diameter away. I think it's a little bit too um, too big in diameter. So we're going to take some of that away, create a foot. I'll do a brief bit of sanding for you because the main emphasis on this piece is going to be the front and the decoration. Okay. Um, but. We'll maybe play around with a couple of different designs before we go through the, to the, 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 the first one, or the, the final one, right? So here we go. Um, by the way, I've been looking at some of your pictures that you've been posting um, from the lockdown series, the Bringing the Skill Centre to Your Home series. Um, fantastic. Loads and loads of smokers, which is great. Loads of mallets, bowls. So it's quite nice because it can be quite lonely. It's just me and Charlie or me and Finley. It's nice to know there are people on the other end. I get your comments and all that sort of thing, but people actually making stuff from them. So it's really, really, it's a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that you're all making stuff. So well done. <laughs> so, okay, let's get this going. And we'll get a little bit of light on the job. And Charlie, I think we can come in a little bit now. Okay. Hopefully, I'm not gonna put the kiss of death on, death on this one. We should have a little bit of a better setup at the moment. We've got a much faster broadband connection as of yesterday. So, well, do I turn the light on, I suppose? We have a much better broadband connection as of yesterday. So, fingers crossed, it's probably going to be the worst now. But let's have a look and see how this goes. So, you know, it's a fairly uneven platter. I didn't spend a huge amount of time centering that up, so we need to clean that up first. I'm just covering my airbrushes and all that delicate equipment over there with the um, dust sheet first because we're going to make a fair few shavings to start with. Charlie can start firing questions as they come through. Alright, so let's start with a 3-8 gouge. Usual thing, skim things down a little bit. So nice and low with the handle. Skimming that surface, I don't want to shock the timber too much. I want to turn the speed up in a second. Handle nice and low because we want the bevel rubbing. If it's up too high, it's more of a roughing gouge action, really. So I'm going to keep that down. Don't forget, guys, Tuesday next week we're going to do a QA. So the questions that you start asking for in preparation for Tuesday dictate what I'm going to be making on Tuesday. So um, keep them coming, they start them coming. 
cutting really well this thing, very beautiful. Sort of presenting the, the gouge almost like a skew when you drop that handle down. About 45 degrees with the angle of the, the cutting edge. I reckon you can just bring that around this way, Charlie, just so they can see what's happening with this. Don't forget you're connected by a lead. One thing we've changed. All right, just like, that's, that's just, yeah, you're there. No, all right. Cameraman says no. I'm going to rethink, hang on. <laughs> I've been told to be patient. Right, here we are. So there, can you get focus in on the, the tip of the tool, Charlie? And I'm afraid I'm going to get you covered in shavings. So you can see what's happening. Drop that handle down and we've got almost like a skew cut going on. You get these lovely fibrous, wispy little shavings coming away. And on end grain, because there's two areas of end grain there, you're going to get the best possible finish. There we are. Thank you, Charlie. That's brilliant. All right, now, just the other side. But I just want to come in at that angle now. Look. There will be a day, everybody, when we've got lovely switchers and all that sort of thing. I don't know how soon that day will be, but we're going to get better and better as we keep going with this. I hope. Tighten the tool rest up a bit more. Um, at some point, can you explain and demonstrate how the different tools make different cuts? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, here's a different cut. So what we were just doing was like a skew chisel. And that's a really, really nice, pleasing cut because that gives you that sheer action. What we're doing at the moment is a pull cut. This is more of a roughing cut, this one. I'm using the bottom edge of that, that uh, bowl gouge to drag that waste timber away. Now, what I'm not getting with this is a bevel rubbing action. So when you don't get the bevel rubbing, you get all these lines and things like that up here. But as it's a roughing cut, not finishing, I'm not too worried about that. Now, all I'm going to do All I want to do here, I want to obviously create somewhere for the bowl gouge, sorry, the um, the chuck to grip. I'm going to use seed jaws. So a set of dividers. There. And I'm going to grab my speed sizer, internal size of the speed sizer, and just gauge the seed jaws, center to center internal C's and I'm going to make a mark. That's the internal size of our C jaws. Um, do you know the difference between the Crown Cryo Chisel uh, and the Crown Pro PM Chisel, apart from the price? Um, so, the, yeah, yeah, two seconds. Let me just sharpen my um, passing tool. Um, yeah, so Crown Cryo is... Um, is cold treated. So instead of like regular um, high speed steel being heat treated to, to develop its um, hardness, cryo is, is the opposite, it's cold treated to do the same job. PM is powder metallurgy. I think that's what it sounds like. It's um, powdered metal basically, so it's fused. Now you'd have to talk to Crown to get the exact um, process of that, but that's the difference. Um, so it's powder metal instead of cr um, cryo treated, cold treated. Uh, why has someone's bowl gouge left a spiral? Is the handle not low enough? A spiral. You might be getting what we refer to as a horrible phenomenon, and I'll be honest, I'm not. I'm not having a dig here at all, but what it a lot of the time it's a an issue when you're just starting out as a as a turner it's called um, bevel bounce and you can get that on bowl gouges you can get it on skew chisels it's basically just a little bit too much pressure on the bevel of the tool um 
uh, it does ju it just disappears when you've been practicing and practicing. It's like it is that old analogy uh, uh, that they people talk about about ride, learning to ride a bike. You know those subtle differences, those subtle balances that some suddenly one day you wake up and you can just ride a bike. Um, turning is the same thing. Understanding all the little pressures to apply and. Um, angles of attack and all that thing take a little bit of time and if you're putting too much pressure on the bevel you literally bounce the bevel off the hard end grain and then it acts a little bit like a, an echo and just gets worse and worse uh, what does the H in H draw stand for? the H in dove H no in H jaws in H jaws, um, so H jaws doesn't really stand for anything. So initially, it started off um, in accidents uh, all way back around about 22, 23 years ago when we started making jaws, and obviously it started with A. Then we went to B. And we went to C, and we carried on like that. Somewhere along the lines, we left out E. I have no idea why. Um, there were a, a lovely couple of uh, wood turning buddies that came up with different ideas for jaws. Mick O'Donnell, the O'Donnell jaws, ODs. A lovely man, Frank Clark, um, who a very very large larger than life character, both physically and um, his sense of humor. He came up with a set of jaws, which were um, known as DS, Big Frank jaws. So when you see a, a set of jaws called DS, it stands for Big Frank. There's a set of jaws that I come up with, which is uh, known as the Havita, um, and I'm not going to tell you why, why they were called Havita. All I'll say is that it was um, a conversation between myself and um, Bernie Styles one night, um, and Havita came up. So I'll let you go. Um, is the suction pipe just for dust? Yeah, we're going to turn that on in a minute. So you might have noticed I'm taking this fairly, um, fairly slowly, fairly gingerly, because ex exact reason that we're just starting to get now. It's a thin piece of timber, and what happens, you get a lot of vib uh, vibration through it. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go over to the smaller bowl gouge, um, and just take a couple of it's all good. Um, which grind do you prefer on the quarter bowl gouge leaves? Quarter inch bowl gouge. I'm going to put a 55 degree bevel angle on most of mine. Um, with a nice deep sweep on the wing. vibration going on let me show you what happens when you get a bit of vibration you get chatter all right I don't want that chatter you can probably see that in the camera there it's quite deep chatter that one so I'm just gonna do a little a slightly different cut here now dropping the handle down I'm gonna present the bottom edge of the tool and we're gonna get little tiny angel hair shavings um, should the dust extractor be on when turning as well as sanding? Dust extraction should be on all the time. Regardless of whether you're sanding, it needs to be on when you're turning and everything. You might think that actually, well I'm not setting a very good example here, but there is this, this is a demonstration. So what I'm, I need you to hear what I'm saying. Um, when you're not here, when you're not watching, I am... Um, 
I have a powered respirator on. I have ear protection as well. All right, I don't just want to protect my lungs, I want to protect my ears. Ear protection on, um, all that sort of stuff. So absolutely, you have that dust extraction on all the time. Uh, what are your thoughts about warming up before turning, as in stretching? Who asked that question? Joe John James Foster. Joe John, right, okay. I'm curious as to why you've asked that one. Yeah, of course I'm always warming up, Joe. Oh God, I, I'm, I'm always warming up. Um, I wouldn't say, so turners, wood turners notoriously have bad backs and that's because the height of the lathe is wrong. However, if I'm production turning and there's lots of production turners out there that would back me up on this one, um, a stretch at the beginning and a stretch before your cup of tea and a stretch at lunch is never going to um, harm you. It's like any activity, isn't it? You're doing it, you're doing a lot of it, then yes, you're going to you're going to need to stretch it out a little bit. Um, if you're production turning, your forearms, your hands, sometimes I wear a hand brace, um, all of those things just to protect myself. Your neck as well. A lathe that's too low, you'll feel it in your in your neck. Cold concrete floors, you'll feel it in your lower back, your neck, all those sorts of things. So, absolutely. Um, you know your body. Can you turn that power socket on there? You know your body, mate. Um, it, yeah, you really. You'll get the little signs. Right, let's just give that a, a rough going over. Uh, how do you dress your buffing wheels? Um, every now and again. Every now and again, um, I'll take a, a rough, unsawn bit of timber, run the buffing wheel, and literally just give it a, a, a rub over with that rough, sawn timber. Um, that's the only way, really. Uh, what caused the chatter in the example? Of obviously vibration, but what caused that? The thickness of timber. It's a very thin piece. Um, that's why I was just taking it a little bit cautiously. It's ultra dry as well, this one. Um, I'm not making excuses. It's just because it's, because it's so thin. You're going to get a little bit of chatter. So nice sharp tools. And alternate your angle of attack. Like I say, that shear cut where we were using where we were achieving those little angel hair um, shavings. That's a great one. That needs to be practiced though on smaller pieces. Because if that goes wrong, if you get it slightly wrong, that'll make a massive grab. So do practice that one. Nice sharp tools, facing the flute right into the work. Sacrificial base there. And all I'm gonna do is just raise the bowl up a little bit onto the secondary base. So let's have a look, see if there's any fibers that need a bit of care. It's been 20 minutes. Thank you, mate. There we are, that's not too bad. Let's go over with a 150, and then we'll get the uh, rotary sand on. When buying blanks, should the blanks remain in the workshop a week or so bef uh, before use to acclimatize? Uh, I'll be honest. Um, I don't think that matters a huge amount. As soon as you, you finish the bowl, you're going to take it indoors anyway. We're all in different, you know, I, I understand that there's people watching in Australia, um, in the different states of America, which, you know, the temperatures are all over the place. Even this country, we can change 10 degrees from one end um, of the country to the other. So, um, if it's wet, if you're wet turning, then we need to take extra care. Don't let it dry out too quickly. Once turned, if you're not sealing or putting any finish on, then again, a little bit of care should be taken. Um, obviously don't sit the pieces on a, on a radiator as soon as you're done. And what a lot of people don't realize is that timber's gonna move anyway, regardless of its, um, regardless of its, its uh, moisture content, because we're not only taking moisture out, we're taking we're releasing stress and pressure, so it, it springs as well. So no, I wouldn't worry about climatizing it at all. There we go, 
Oh, just a little touch up with that one. slightly finer. Go to a, a 240. And we want a 240 grip and the braces as well. Now next week, said we've got a Q&A on Tuesday and then I'm going to go right the way back to one of the first demos that we've done when we when we started these because we're getting questions about quite a lot of questions about buffing wheels we're getting questions about jam chucking so one of my favorite demos that I've been doing right in my apprenticeship is uh, this wooden fruit we've done it before back in March but we're going to give it another go make a couple of pieces of fruit for you. It's always a good one, there's lots of um, lots of technique in that. Right now 400 grit in both hand and rotary. Um, do you have any ideas on how to use all the tools from a sitting position as someone can't stand for too long that they've got? Um, I don't minor have, disability. Yeah, no, I don't have any experience personally. Um, there are several turners out there, including demonstrators, that um, turn from a seat position for various reasons. Um, there's a few, uh, oh, well, both in the UK and, and uh, in the States that I've watched demonstrate before. Tony Wilson is one of them in this country email just to see what experiences they have. Certainly not, I don't believe there's, there's going to be a huge difference in, um, in turning tools. I've taught lots of people um, that were confined to wheelchairs and there hasn't really been a huge amount of difference for them um, apart from obviously like people that um, you know, like me, they're using uh, a leg standing. We're all different heights, and just we need to understand that people in wheelchairs are different heights as well. So, we just need to make sure that that lane is still the right height for them in their wheelchair. Lots of different builds out there. So, that's the only thing. Right there, we are. That's it's got a quite a nice ripple on that one. Quite a pretty bit of timber. So, we're not going to do anything to the back. We're going to turn it over, get a nice surface on the front, and then put a little bit of. Um, a little bit of that nighttime scene on there. So that's all we do, sand it. I, I, would, uh, I wouldn't put any finish on it at the moment because if we're going to put something on the front, I'd want to overspray the back a little as well. Um, and if you put a finish on there, then obviously that finish won't, won't stay there. <clears throat> so we're going to just flip them over. Um, someone's been given some cherry logs and they've sealed the ends with PVA. Yeah. Um, how long do you think they should leave them before starting to turn? Before starting to turn, um, if, it were, if they were completely green, then what you do need to do, it, you know, depending on the diameter, what you will need to do is split them down through the middle. Don't worry if you do that, because you're not going to lose the maximum diameter. One thing I will say there, um, a good example over here. So this is a piece of the Fucus that we turned or went to turn last week. So <clears throat> this is what happens to logs if you leave them solid. You're right, we're always going to get spider webs of cracks coming out. Now, if you wanted to turn a bowl across, um, or bowls get turned from the side of the tree anyway, so you split it straight through the heart. That releases a huge amount of tension. Um, I would then advise you to rough turn it, to be honest, then into you know into thick bowls and let them dry. But if you wanted to leave it solid to maybe cut squares out of it, leave it as long as you possibly can, split it through its heart, seal those, um, seal the end grain up. If it was that size, in lengths of say three foot, two, three foot, then you're gonna have to leave it probably for at least a year. Um, if you rough turn it, you could get away with six or seven months. Um, but if, uh, yeah, but if solid, probably about a year. Um, in that size, obviously the bigger, you've got to multiply it. The general term of five years and so on. Um, some timbers differ slightly. You all right, Charlie? We've got connection issues. Keeps on saying 
trying to reconnect. Give us a a heads up, a nod, guys. Let us know what the um, what the connection is like. Just just so we can't really do much today. But if, if it's not good enough, then we can do something for next time. But let us know. Is it good today? Is it bad today? Not. Just up and down. Okay. What are people saying? Nothing yet. Right, there we are. So now we've got the front of it. It can get a little bit noisy uh, now. So again, we're working on a very thin piece. Okay, so I'm going to start right on the edge. Get that nice and clean first, and I can. I won't need to worry about uh, the chatter. So lay speed zero. Turn the machine on. Just going to skim up. I'm just going to use the bevel. It just drops out. Just drops out completely. Like every now and again, it drops out. That's what they're saying. Oh, okay. So I'm just supporting the back of the bowl now with my fingers. Can you recommend an internal finish for a fruit bowl? Let's finish that bit so you can hear what I'm saying. But uh, yeah, I, I would always, personally, I'd go with a finishing oil. You can go with food safe oil, um, but you know, a finishing oil is, it, you've got to wait for it to dry. It's, it's, most of them are to what we call toy safe, um, which is fine because you're not going to be in contact with wet foods. Um, most fruit um, won't be wet anyway. Um, they will be, you know, it gives you a better finish. It dries quicker than a food safe oil. Um, salad, on the other hand, salad then absolutely food safe oil all of the time because it's actually coming in direct contact, contact with wet foods which you'll be eating. So for fruit, I tend to go finishing oil um, and salad, food safe. Right, a little bit of sanding on there. I know we haven't done anything here yet. Bear with me, we will. Not, but not until we finish painting. Uh, what lathe would you recommend for someone who's never used one before? Never used one before, um, I would probably say go small to start with, maybe a bench top. Um, then you've got several choices in bench top lathe then, um, where it's a fixed speed, a variable speed. Um, and for a bench top, you get nice small projects. Pretty much everything we're doing um, in this series, you could do on a bench top machine. But then, you know, you're not gonna break the bank. Um, but you can still make decent projects. It's been half an hour. One thing that obviously we've been a rack of rain in terms of things to bring you. A couple of things I have thought of which we haven't covered yet is piercing. So we'll do something nice and thin and do some piercing one day. 
I'm going to keep my promise. We're going to do something for the fishermen one day as well. We're going to turn some floats, turn some cork, which is a very old uh, technique of turning. That's quite fun. Uh, we'll do some fishing lures and things like that. things I won't do. We've had a couple of suggestions. Someone suggested that I show people how to turn steps and hats, things like that. Well, for me, I have never done one. There are a couple of absolutely first-class fantastic um, demonstrators that do that, and that's their signature pieces. So Andrew Hall, a hat man, that's his thing, that's what he does. You want to see someone turn a hat, go and watch Andrew Hall. You know, Hannah Smithson as well from the States. Both of those guys, watch them. Don't watch me, because I don't really know what I'm doing when it comes to turning hats. So watch those guys. Um, and everybody suggests Chinese balls. But I'm not going to do a Chinese ball. Never turned one. It'd certainly take longer than an hour. Um, so have a look online guys, you'll find somebody doing Chinese balls. I need to be quite picky here with scratches. Let's get that light around. I need to get rid of any scratches. Because one thing that you will notice when you're airbrushing, it will pick up the slightest little scratch you have. That was just a 400 there. So I'm gonna keep on that. I need a bit more on that one. Could you explain what an in-des option is on a lathe? In a few words. Have a look. An indexing option. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I'd like to do a project. Um, I'm just going to turn that off for a minute. Um, I'd like to turn a project that involves the indexing because I don't think we use it enough. And I've got a whole series of projects which use um, indexing, and I've demonstrated them numerous times. But unfortunately, they are Christmas demonstrations. Um, I am going to do them, but I'm going to wait just for a little bit, just to get out of summer. So tune in in September, and we're going to start a few Christmassy projects. Christmas has started for me because I'm writing uh, articles for the magazine, for Wood Turning Magazine, and we're in the Christmas edition. So um, I will embrace Christmas um, in September, but I'm going to leave it for the minute. So we'll do some Christmas pyramids, we'll do some German nutcrackers. I know people have been asking for the nutcrackers. So we're going to do all of that. I'll have plans and everything ready for you to see and all that sort of thing. So yeah, look forward to that. Um, which would you say, sandpaper or ab abronet? Um, they're both great really. Depend on, well, not sandpaper as such. I might always, I say sandpaper quite a lot. I don't really mean sandpaper. I mean abrasive material. Um, Abronet, for those of you who are watching that aren't quite sure what Abronet is, oh, this is a perforated type of abrasive. So I've got two good quality abrasives here. I've got the Abronet and I've got the RB, the ultimate abrasive. Fantastic, both great. If you're wet sanding and if you're um, turning really waxy materials or oily timbers, then go for Abronet all the time. It's a very cool, or even exotic, it's a very cool um, cutting abrasive um, where the papers aren't so much. But um, my, you know, the bulk of my abrasive is always going to be um, material-backed abrasive because it's a little, it's a little bit cheaper. Um, but that's not the main reason. It's just 
a little bit more flexible, all those sorts of things. So that, that's my reasoning. So let's get some airbrush going. I'm going to be spraying at around about 35 psi and we're going with a black fur. So that white is not going to be white for long. Um, how do you keep the German smokers smoking when they put the body on it goes out? So, right, you've not got enough flu. So you've either got your mouth hole too small, so it's not drawing enough air. Um, I, would have, I would have thought that's probably the main reason. Um, think about you've got a nice a bit of um, a nice couple of holes in the bottom, you need to have the equal amount of pressure coming out. So it usually is that, make a little bit more room around the mouth. So I was just wobbling there whilst my compressor was building up nicely. So we're going to blacken this now. So, uh, what is indexing? Um, tell you what, give me two seconds. Let's give this a couple of generous coats. We'll leave that to dry for a second while we explain indexing. way or a means of stopping your lathe at certain positions in its rotation. Um, you've got on mine, I've got an indexing pin back here with 36 positions. Can people see where I'm pointing, John? An indexing pin back here which has 36 positions um, on it and I've got numbers um, to those relevant positions here. So I can stop it. Say for instance I want to um, use a drill guide and cut holes for a clock face. 12, 3, 6, and 9, and all the various ones in between. So I can divide that up into its, um, its portions. Um, I tend to use it to create hubs where I need 12 holes in a, in a, a wheel hub to um, then connect um, impellers into. So I use it for that quite a lot. You can think about using it on routing, for instance, on um, table spindles, um, uh, staircase spindles, uh, uh, chair legs, that sort of stuff, where you want to put reeds down. So route reeds using a router block, so you need to stop that spindle at a certain point. Um, so that's indexing, it's just a, a, an index position in the, um, in the rotation. There we are, that's about ready. I'll tell you what we will do though, just in case, because we applied a lot of ink there, or a lot of stain rather, and remember we're using chestnut st uh, spirit stains here. I'm going to use my little craft heater. It's not a hairdryer, remember I said on Tuesday, it is a nice slow um, heat, there's not a huge amount of air speed there so it doesn't blow paint all over the place or dust all over the place, it's heat more than anything. Just to add a, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of heat. Now if you remember the white that we were going to use on here has to be acrylic. Um, I tend to find that the uh, spirit stain white just, just disappears fairly quickly on the black so I, I like to use a, an acrylic instead. So let's make our scene. So if we, if you remember what we used or what we've done on Tuesday was that little scene there. We'll do something similar uh, today. We'll start off with a little flick to get some stars going. A little bit of finger painting with a toothbrush. Uh, do you sell the items you make? Um, I do. I sell the items, I sell plans to make them, all those sorts of things. Um, but I don't, how do I explain this? I sell the items I make, but I don't make to sell, if that makes sense. Um, most of the things I make are for demonstrations, I'm a demonstrator mainly, or an article writer, that sort of thing. So um, the nice thing is the what's left from my demonstrations are nice pieces. Well, hopefully they're nice pieces. So here we're just making some stars at the moment. There's a big splodge there that I'm unsure about whether it's dry. 
will be in a minute. That's going to be one of our. Let's drop that. Go on. <laughs> we use a little cut and a piece of cars, just a little slit through. And I'm only going to do a couple. I'm going to use a gravity fed airbrush. Gravity fed because I can just put a couple of little drops in the top. Same pressure, I'm not changing pressure for any of this. And I'm just gonna pick on, let's just do two. There's a big one there, that one that I didn't think was dry. And we're gonna just spray against the slit. There we are. So we get that. It's in and 40 minutes. 40 minutes, thank you, shall we? And we'll do the same thing again. Against the split. And then wherever you've got that, right in the centre, you just want to do a little bit of highlighting. Just make that star really shine. Okay. There we are, just a nice little, little bit of dazzle. I won't do too much more, let's just do one. Now let's do, let's do a moon. So I'm going to use one of my few um, purchased templates. Let's put the moon over here. moon and then we want to have a few little nebula clouds We're whizzing through this one let me get some tissue Charlie just hold that airbrush don't do it up a little bit of tissue remember with the tissue we're just going to cut it against the grain so not down its length cut it against the grain make sort of gnarly shapes Go. Let's get. We get a w right away from the moon and stuff. Let's go. We we'll go here, sort of where there's a little bit blank, and we're going to need several pairs of hands here. Let me connect my airbrush whilst I'm holding the tissue. So we're going to let the air pressure keep that tissue down. So remember, down for air, and then back for. For colour, for ink, or in this case stain, and that leaves us with a nice pattern, like a little cloud. Let's use the opposite piece. Just going to do a little bit of back filling these clouds down here. So what the the reason for the white is the white is the carrier for the color. So in a minute when we put color on, it's going to show up on the white. I'm going to leave a few of the real heavy points, make it really nice and bright. Those right at the front there. And we're just controlling the amount of ink by gently pulling that trigger back. And the sharpness of the spray by how close you are to the workpiece. There we are, that'll do. This is more. And we're going to start now with a blue, always my favourite. Start with, and we're going to start colouring in some of these clouds, get them a, a little blue tinge. Just pop 
Pop the extractor on, guys, just for a minute. That's the side like Charlie. Got 13 minutes left. A little bit more colour to that. There's your blue. Let's go. Um, let's go yellow. So, that being done, we've got to make sure we're far enough away from the workpiece to not capture um, shavings and then scrape off what we've done. The beauty of airbrushing, of course, though, this is dry. We, you know, we're not getting anything off on our hands. So that's, that's why I like using um, that technique. It's, it's sort of instant, really. So let's take a, a small cut from the middle. We'll go with a small bowl gouge to start with. Um, do you know if Axminster to do a dual action gravity fed airbrush? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, if Team Axminster can't find it today, I'll speak to um, speak to everybody. We'll get it put up for next Tuesday, um, the part numbers. But absolutely, yes. Um, I'm positive. It'll be Spraycraft, I'm pretty sure. It'll be the manufacturer. Okay, so we're just going to create a nice bright white centre to this bowl, or plate, sorry, it's not very deep. It's going to be a nice little tea, key dish or toffee dish. I'm about deep enough. Now I've got some screw holes. I want to go deep enough to take the screw holes out and they're just there. Look. Let's see where those screw holes are. I'm just going to give that gouge a little bit of a sharpen. Screw holes are gone, so just a sharpen. I'm going to sharpen on my. Bring the camera around a minute, Charlie. Would you? Got ten minutes. Ten minutes to go. That's messy area. Right, so we've got the CBM wheel here, my slow speed grinder, I'm going to check that both of my metal wheels are touching that disc, that gives me my distance here. And now I'm going to put the gouge through the jig, I'm going to check for 65 millimeters. This little setting jig is set to 55, 65, 75, so I want to set to 65. There we are, so that's correct now. My jig settings on position four. So we've got position four, 65 mil protrusion, and then what we call hole A on the bar, and just to ensure that both metal discs are touching, which gives us our distance. Nice, quick, simple. And because um, it's CBN, you get very little sparking or heating as well. Slow speed grinder, this one. So this is running around about 1400 revs. There we are. 
barely a spark there. So I didn't see any sparks actually. And then Charlie guide me. Alright, nice clean single bevel. Just when I say single bevel, I haven't got I haven't taken the heel off in this instance. <coughs> If I did, that would help me a little bit because it would take away these ribs. I'm not going to worry too much today. If I was doing a bigger project, then I would need to really. Um, let's just have a look and see. I'm going to double check for those screw holes. And that's fine. I think I've come out as far as I want to. I've taken out any of the rough center. I want to show the picture off. That's the main thing. So just a little finishing cut. across that surface with your bracelet. So really protect that surface. When you look at my finger, I'm the corner of the abrasive right on the tip of my finger. Give that a little dust off for a minute. There we are, we'll take that off. Yeah, there's a little bit more sanding to do, guys, but you don't need to sit or stand there and watch me do that. If you could pan back to me a little bit now, Charlie. So there's our, our little moonlight bowl. That's the, it's the, just a little bit of playing around with the airbrushes. That's not the only thing we can do, obviously. Um, there's all sorts of, of embellishments that you can do with an airbrush. That was just a scene. If you wanted to do simple lines or, or enhance an edge, that sort of thing, absolutely, you know, it's all there you know, ready to do. I just wanted to show you really how accessible, how easy airbrushes are to use. And I know that, that probably use that word too many times easy, but it really is, just pick it up and have a play with it. Start off with the um, practice uh, piece that I was doing on uh, Tuesday, just a white piece of paper, make some spheres, play with shadowing, draw, um, just do your name, all those sorts of things, just to get used to it, and then start experimenting on, on your work pieces. Worst case scenario, you sign it back off and start again. So just play with it, you know, it's not, not gonna hurt. There's lots of inspiration out there, guys. Um, I've already mentioned people like Andrew Paul. Sorry. Move the light. Move the light, sorry. I was just, um, I've mentioned people like Andrew Hall, if you're looking at like, hat making, but he's also a great airbrush artist. Nick Agar Studios, you look at the world. But there's loads of people out there. Have a look, play yourself. You will soon get hooked, I can guarantee it. So come back on Tuesday. Until then, have a fantastic weekend. Happy turning. 
Q&A on Tuesday, don't forget, so give us all your, your questions and then we're going to do a little bit of playing around with wooden fruit on the, on the Thursday. So have a great weekend everybody, see you on Tuesday, same time, same place, my workshop, 4 o'clock. Bye bye.